Welcome to the Jack Joseph Moten Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. We are delighted to welcome you today um, to our event to celebrate the publication of this wonderful new book, My Second Favorite Country, How American Jewish Children Think About Israel by Sivan Zakai. I'm John Levison. I have the honor of serving as the director of the Mandel Center. And today I'm taking the place of my friend and colleague, Sharon Feynman Nemzer, who was scheduled to be our, our host and our moderator for this event. Unfortunately, she came down with laryngitis yesterday. So, so I'm stepping in for Sharon. A few logistics before we begin. The conversation is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the center's website um, in, a, in a few days when that's prepared. And we're using a, a webinar format, so um, the audience will be able to see me and the other uh, panelists when they come on, um, but not the rest of the audience. Um, but, uh, but all of the audience should feel free to participate by posting, um, by posting your questions. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We almost certainly won't be able to take all of the questions, but we do hope to get to some of them. So, so please um, take advantage of that function. And, uh, and I know that all of the panelists are interested in the conversation, in the questions that our conversation raises for you. As many of you uh, already know, Sivan is very active in working with teachers and parents and would be happy to hear from you uh, directly with your questions and we'll post her email address uh, in the chat. Um, and finally, we are happy that the book, the book that we're celebrating, My Second Favorite Country, is currently available from NYU Press at a discount. And we'll post the discount code in the chat for you to use so that you can buy your own copy. And now let me say a few words uh, about the book itself. My second favorite country, the book that we're talking about, is a product of a research project here at the Mandel Center called the Project on Children's Learning About Israel. It's a project that Sivan conceptualized and launched and led. And when I say that she led the research project, what I mean is that she's led this project for over a decade. Now, that might seem like a long time to pursue a research project, uh, but the reason that the project has taken so long is that it was designed from the outset as a longitudinal study, which would, a study that would track children over time, returning to them over and over again each year, year after year, to see how they change in the ways that they talk and feel and think about Israel. And this is work that is actually quite literally unprecedented. Nobody's ever undertaken this kind of longitudinal focus in Israel education. And it's in fact, it's extremely rare to have any kind of longitudinal study within the field of Jewish education. And many of us in the field have been enjoying her uh, papers, Sivan's papers that have emerged over the years uh, along the way and watching her uh, present her findings at, at conferences and, and at workshops. Um, but now all of these ideas and all of the the research has been pulled together into this book, and that is certainly an occasion that is worth celebrating. We're delighted to do so. I want to say that, to my mind, the best part of the book is the way that Sivan does what really good empirical scholarship does, which is that she lets her subjects speak. She lets us hear the children's voices all while putting those voices into a context of the themes and, and the trends that she heard over time through her careful and rigorous analysis. So we, we as the reader, we get to kind of hear the data, but it's, these are the significant moments that, um, that are significant on the basis of her careful scholarship. The book provides windows into the children's thinking about questions of identity and community, about conflict, about patriotism. It also presents a broader argument about a different way of thinking about the whole enterprise of Jewish education, of, I'm sorry, of Israel education. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to hear about that in, in the course of the time that we have together today. Now we've gathered together a wonderful group of people uh, to be on our panel today. Um, they're all incredibly smart, they're incredibly 
experienced educators. These are people who have written about Israel education and also done a lot of the work themselves. So first, of course, uh, on our panel is our author, Sivan Zakai. She is the Sarah Lee Associate Professor of Jewish Education at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. Um, she works with educators from early childhood on. She's also, as I mentioned before, she's also developed a practice working with parents as well on uh, some of these issues. She, uh, it's, I also mentioned she serves as the director of the Children's Learning About Israel Project. And she also co-directs a different project called Project Orly Research and Leadership in Israel Education. Next, uh, Karen Freeman is the Dean and Chief, Chief Academic Officer of the Spurtis Institute for Jewish Learning and Leadership in Chicago. Karen comes from a background in international security. She did her doctorate at MIT. Before that, she served in the IDF. But since 2014, she's been working in the field of Israel education in various ways at Spurtis, at the I Center, at Hillel, and elsewhere. And Karen also has a chapter about Israel educators coming out in a book about Israel education, a different book about Israel education that Sivan is co-editing. Um, that's going to be an edited volume, uh, which will be published, we expect, sometime next year in 2023. Robbie Gringas is coming to us from uh, Israel, where he works as an independent writer, an educator, and a performer. For a long time, he was the artist in residence at Makom. And more recently, he's been working on a new initiative with Abby Dauber Stern, trying to get people, help people to argue better. He and Abby are co authors of a really interesting new book, just come out, called Stories for the Sake of Arguments. And finally, Jonah Hassenfeld is the Director of Learning and Teaching at Salman Shafu Day School here in Boston. Jonah spent a couple of years developing new educational initiatives at the Mandel Foundation. Before that, he worked at GAN Academy. Um, among other things, uh, at GAN, he worked with teachers to help them to become investigators of their own practice, including getting them to learn more about what their students were actually thinking. Jonah did his doctorate at Stanford with a focus on Israel education and history education. Uh, and he has a chapter about Israel education coming out in a different volume, a book about Jewish day schools that, uh, that I am co-editing with my colleagues, Jonathan Krasner and Sharon Avni. So as I said, um, these are all very accomplished scholars and practitioners. Um, I'm also very, very happy to say these are people with whom I have been in conversation about the teaching of Israel for a decade or more. Um, and so it's really wonderful to have all of you um, with us today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to start things off by asking Sivan to tell us more about the project and the book. Um, Sivan, tell us what motivated you to undertake this study. Uh, who are these children that you studied over this decade or almost decade? Um, how did you get them to talk to you, to share their thoughts and, and feelings? Um, and then what surprised you? What really stands out from this work as a, as a surprise uh, from, uh, from all of the time that you spent listening to the kids over and over and over again? First of all, John, thank you so much for having me and to the Center for convening this conversation and to my fellow panelists for showing up and sharing their own wisdom with us today. And also thank you to the Center for supporting this research project over the last decade. The original impetus behind undertaking this project came from a workshop that I was giving for a group of teachers. Um, in Israel education, which I thought I knew a lot about at the time. And there was a conversation that was happening between three teachers, one of whom worked at the elementary school level, one of whom worked at the middle school level, and one of whom worked at the high school level. And they could not figure out what constituted developmentally appropriate conflict education. And they turned to me and they said, wait, which grade is it? Like, when, when can we do this? And I thought, I have no idea. I do not know the answer to that question, but I know how to find out the answer to that question. And I know who needs to tell us the answer to that question. And that's not 
us, the talking heads of Israel education, but children themselves. And that was really what started me out on the initial process of investigating children's thinking, feeling, and learning about Israel over time. It's really, really hard work, not just to follow kids over time, but to do the initial setup to get kids and their parents to agree to a multi-year commitment. And that I am so, so grateful to the kids and the parents of the kids in this study for agreeing to let me learn from them for so many years. These kids are all kids that I originally got contact with through three Jewish day schools in the Los Angeles area. I wanna be clear though, that this is not actually a study of day school students. This is a study of children who I've been following over time in the many winding paths that their lives take. So some of these kids have primarily attended suburban public schools or charter schools. There's a kid in the study who's homeschooled. There's multiple kids in the study who have back, bounced back and forth between different kinds of schools over time. They're all kids from the Los Angeles area, and they're all kids who have been getting a Jewish education of some form throughout their childhood. Although the places and ways in which that Jewish education has happened has varied not only um, between the students, but also in some cases in a single child's trajectory over time. The, the thing about Los Angeles is not only is it the fourth largest Jewish community of the world, but it's also the most diverse Jewish community anywhere on the planet. And the kids and parents in this study um, come from a lot of different backgrounds. The parents of the kids in the study were born in eight different countries. If you look to their grandparents, that you double that, they were born in 16 different countries. Six distinct languages are spoken in the children's homes, Hebrew, Farsi, French, Spanish, Czech, and English. And those are just the primary languages. They all live in Jewish communities that are really fluid in terms of the, um, the cultural and the religious backgrounds uh, of other Jews in those communities. Steve, I just, just want to emphasize, so you're talking about the diversity of their backgrounds, and that's enormously important to you. And at the same time, you were not somehow seeking for a representative sample that somehow matched the, pop, the general American Jewish population. That wasn't the goal at all. No. And that, the reason that wasn't the goal is because that's actually not possible in this kind of research to follow kids over time. What is possible is to cast a net and to see who is willing to play ball for so many years. Yeah. Um, so, right, I do not make any claims that this is a representative sample. That's not really a possible thing to find in this in the context of this kind of research. But I do want people to know that this is not a, you know, one kid replicated a bunch of times. These kids are different from one another in all sorts of ways. And that matters because children's development itself is both idiosyncratic and common. All children are unique and special and wonderful in their own ways. And children often follow common patterns of development. And the goal of this research was really to capture both of those. How we investigated with the children over time, and, and by we, I mean myself, but also a team of research assistants led by Hannah Tobin Cohen, who I know is with us today, um, who really worked with the kids year after year. And we asked a whole bunch of open-ended questions. So some of these are pretty simple questions. What is Israel? Where is Israel? When you think about Israel, what does it mean to you? We also asked a whole bunch of playful questions. Like if an alien came down from outer space and knew absolutely nothing about life on earth, but did understand English, how would you explain to this alien what it means to be Jewish? what it means to be an American citizen, what it means to be Israeli. We showed them sound clips and images and um, newspaper clippings, and we got them to talk about them by asking, hey, what is this? What does it make you think about? What do you know about this? And we asked the children to tell us stories about how they saw the world, asking questions like, tell me a story about what's been happening in Israel recently as a way of getting their understanding of current events, or tell me a story about 
how Israel became Israel. And by asking the same questions year after year after year, although we did add questions over time as the kids got older and had more ability to sit and talk and listen, we never took questions away. By hearing children's answers to the same questions year after year, we were really able to get a sense of how do children think, how do they feel, and how do they change over time. Many, many things have surprised me about the wisdom of these amazing children. But the two that I wanna to call to our attention at the beginning or at the outset of this conversation is that I was really surprised again and again at just how young children were when they were thinking about incredibly big ideas. What does it mean to be part of a community? What is conflict? How should people live together in society? What does it mean to be Jewish? Children were thinking about these really big questions from a very young age. And the other thing that really surprised me and continues to astound me is how much of, ch of children's understanding about Israel came from places outside of formal schooling. I knew and expected kids to talk about things that they might have learned from their rabbis or teachers, but also they talked about learning from their parents and their grandparents and a lot, lot, lot from the internet and from social media and from their peers and really children's understanding is constructed by piecing together sometimes really tiny discrete bits of information and trying to create a bigger picture in their own heads about the connections between the things that they learned in all of these places. So that's great, Sivan. So I, I, wanna, I wanna just clarify, when you say that um, how young they were when they were, uh, how, how much they spoke about complicated questions, about conflict, about uh, political tensions. Um, you weren't asking them about those topics. So how did that emerge? You said, tell me a story and then, and then what happens? Yeah, so I would say, hey, tell me a story about something that's been happening in Israel recently. And the kids would start by saying, around second grade, hey, I wanna tell you about this war that's happening in Israel right now. Um, I had a, um, an ideological and methodological commitment to not planting ideas in children's heads. So um, all of the research was constructed in a way, I kind of imagine it like a big funnel. I would ask a big, broad question and then a kid would say something and then Hannah or I would say, okay, based on that thing you just told me, can you tell me more? And we would dig then into their understanding of particular ideas but only mirroring the language that the kids had already used, trying to get a sense of what they understood, what they thought, what they felt. Right, and so similarly on the second point, you, you the, the second point of surprise, you weren't asking them, you know, where do you, you know, where do you consume media? You were asking these broad questions and then listening carefully or analyzing the data very, very carefully to see what they reported and, and where they reported those things came from, right? Yes, and we, sometimes we did ask kids, wait, where did you hear that? How did you uh -huh. learn that? Yeah. Um, for sure, as a follow-up question, um, especially for the things that we were surprised to hear them talk about. But um, this was a lot of careful listening to a group of kids over the course of a decade. And if you give children a chance to share their thoughts and feelings, in a non-judgmental space where you're not trying to say, here's what you should be thinking and feeling, but just, hey, actually you're the expert on your own life. So can you teach me how you think and how you feel? And kids are willing to talk a lot. They talk more as they're older, but even, even the kids when we had them in kindergarten were able to share quite a lot of their yeah. own thinking with us. Yeah, so, so you know, this is not a study of, um, I don't know, kids' use of smartphones, but you heard a lot about their learning from technology, either their own, sometimes their parents, right? As soon as they, as soon as they turn, turn from uh, sort of oral listeners to uh, uh, learners to to textual learners then then they start to access material through the through their smartphones yes that's right so there's a transition that most kids make somewhere between second and third grade 
a transition that literacy experts call the transition between uh, learning to read and reading to learn. Although of course we know that even younger kids also read to learn, but once kids are fluid readers, they are picking up information from a whole bunch of different spaces. Um, in the aftermath of the 2014 war, kids were talking to us about um, watching over a parent's shoulder as the parent was scrolling through Facebook and then saying, hey, I saw this headline, I'm gonna go do my own independent search. My parents don't even know about that, by the way, um, because I was really curious and no one's talking to me about this stuff. So I kind of want to learn about it. And kids were learning all sorts of information from sites that were not intended to be places for children's learning. And yet nonetheless, were very, very important for, um, for children's learning. Right, right. And, and that learning, you know, they learn all kinds of things. They learn good things. They learn bad things. They learn accurate things. They learn inaccurate things. They they understand things well and they misunderstand things um, kind of like the rest of life. Uh, you know, at certain points in the book, you, you make the analogy to sex education. Um, so there, there's a lot, to be, um, a lot to be learned there as well. Um, I, wanna, I wanna bring in our panelists now um, uh, and turn to each of you to hear uh, some, of your, some of your thoughts and reactions and, and including also your questions um, for Sivan that, that were raised by, um, by your reading of, of the book. So Karen, why don't we start with you? What are, what are some of the things that stood out for you as you, uh, as you encounter this book? Maybe questions that it raised for you. Sure, thanks, John. And thank you, Sivan, both for uh, including me in this panel, but also for uh, producing this wonderful book. Um, I think that the, you know, I deal mostly in the world of conflict education. And while Sivan's book, I think, initially didn't seek to start there, um, some of the insights are the things that really um, stuck out to me. And so first, I think sometimes there's a fear amongst educators that we're opening up Pandora's boxes and that there's all this stuff that we don't want to be the first ones to introduce. And I think my personal experience with my own children has often been that, whoops, they, they already know. And so how do we uh, contextualize it? But I think Sivan's study really pulled out that they're reading, they're seeing, they're hearing. I know my experience was with my son who was seven in 2014 was that he, he heard an NPR story from the back of the van and that opened up his world. But it seems like that seems to be a consistent finding, which is that as soon as kids are reading and listening and hearing the things that we're reading and hearing and listening, that they know what's going on. They may not know all the details or all the context, but we have to be aware that there is not this ideal Israel that's out there that we've painted for them, but that they are curious learners and they're gonna hear and see things, some of which are, are quite challenging, even at ages maybe that we as parents or as educators don't, don't yet wanna address, but that perhaps have to start to think differently. Um, and I think coming along the other side of that was this frustration that Sivan talked about that she heard from the children when they got a little bit older in third, fourth and fifth grade, about the lack of conversations about those kinds of things that they were hearing about. And I think for me, one of the key findings that really stuck with me was this idea that the frustration was actually not directed at Israel, um, but really the frustration was directed at the educators and the parents who were perhaps you know, not speaking about these issues or not bringing the really, not addressing the important questions that they had about Israel. And in a certain sense, I think this was the other piece, which was that these young kids um, and you know, increasingly older kids were actually able to deal with the imperfections of Israel or even some really challenging things. That wasn't what was troubling them. What was troubling them was that there wasn't a space for them to explore this further with the people that they trust. And so in a certain way, they could deal with the imperfections, but not with the denial, right? And not with the sort of obfuscating these challenging things that were happening. And so that in a certain way is the for me, at least, is part of the trust that we build with young learners that they could come to us and discuss difficult things. And when we deny them, the frustration is directed at us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's less a fear of what will it do to their relationship to Israel, which I know there's a lot of research that suggests it's actually not going to damage their relationship to Israel, but it will damage their relationship with us. And that, to me, was a, a really important finding and reframing around which what is it that we're harming when we choose to not talk about things. Um, right. I'll stop there. And and I know you know Karen just to, to talk about uh, about your work for a second. I mean, you just said when we choose not to talk about things, 
um, sometimes we choose not to because we're uncomfortable. We're not, we're not, you know, we feel there's a, a, um, a, a barrier. We feel uh, ill prepared to talk about, um, a, about conflict, for example. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a, a real challenge for, for Israel education, but, but this work just makes it that much, that much sharper. Um, thank you. I, I, there's a, there's a point here about, um, Sivan, you write in the book about um, the similarity between the phenomenon that you found, that kind of frustration, um, between that frustration and the you never told us campaign, the kind of hashtag you never told us campaign. Maybe we'll have a chance to circle back to that um, later, the similarities and the differences between those two um, phenomena. Um, Jonah, when I turn to you. Tell us uh, some of the, the things that surprised or stood out for you um, or questions that it raises for you. Uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, John. And it's, it's so wonderful to be here with everyone. Um, I, I sort of want to share, you know, three three ideas of things that, that stuck out at me that I've been thinking about since I read this book. So first, um, you know, in the chapter about um, kids' views of the conflict, there, you know, is a story of a girl, Samantha, who when you ask her when she learned about the conflict, she tells this story of how she, she heard her mommy talking about it when she was in her mommy's tummy. And so she was born knowing about the conflict. And, and I think for me, that really stood out um, in the spirit of, you know, Peter Berger's book, The Social Construction of Reality, um, that for this child, the conflict for her is just part of the fabric of her reality. And she doesn't have any account really of, of where this knowledge came from. And I think that made me just think deeply about, you know, Israel education, but Jewish education in general, and kind of what are the things that, that our children grow up with um, feeling are part of their backdrop. And I think that certainly ties into Karen's point of, of you know, this fear that educators have that we are going to reveal something to kids. I think no matter what topic we're talking about, you know, we are giving ourselves way too much uh, credit for being the people who reveal things to kids. And, um, you know, I find, I mean, in after reading Sivan's book, you know, I find myself now really asking my own children a lot of open-ended questions to try to plumb the depths of their reality and how that reality is constructed. And so I think that, um, in the case of the conflict as being part of young American Jews reality, you know, it, it's a fascinating point that we could talk about. And also I think we, you know, when we think about all the other things um, that we worry about exposing or not exposing our children to, you know, it has this broad applicability, I think beyond, you know, the narrow case of, of the book. Um, the, second, the second story I kind of wanted to highlight um, also follows up on this idea of, of you know, what, what you know, what don't we tell kids about? And that, you know, and, I, and when I was in grad school, um, I did try to have a lot of conversations with, with undergrads, um, you know, about this sense of disillusionment that they found when they would take an Israel studies class and like find things out. And I actually found that when I pushed them, it often turned out that they weren't as disillusioned as they said. So, you know, there was one, one student who I talked to who said like, Oh, I never heard about um, you know some of the you know troubling events of the war, you know the 1948 war until I took this class. And then I started asking, well, like, what about in high school? Did you ever have a chance to learn about this? And the the student said, you know, one time I had to do a book report, and I did this book report about Darius Seen, and my teacher told me you can't write about this. And so then I said, oh, but like you did actually read about it in high school, you know. And then as we as we sort of played it out, I I, I one thing I really wondered about. Um, is, is this sense of disillusionment? Is it actually about knowledge that kids don't have and then do have? Or, I mean, I'm sure there are other possibilities too, but I also wonder, is there something about the, the developmental story you tell about Israel that is really just a story about human development? That like kids, all kids at various points are gonna feel the sense that their elders disappointed us. And that in this particular case that finds expression through the lens of Israel education, because honestly, as, as a professor of mine, Steve Zipperstein, you know, once said to me, there, there really are no taboos left in American Jewish life, except maybe Israel. So if a kid wants to push 
adults buttons. The best way to do that is by taking, you know, a, a critical of Israel point of view. And maybe, you know, a hundred years ago, that would have been, you know, eating a cheeseburger, but like, nobody cares about that anymore. You know, so I, I just, I find myself thinking like the second big question I have is like, what is the, the resonance of this book for kind of how we think about developmental psychology in general and kind of how kids, these kids are using Israel as a way um, to fuel their own, um, you know, their own development in some ways. And I, I think there's a lot to explore there. And then third, and this is the last thing, um, I, you know, I have been thinking a lot about what this book says to the current moment in American politics. Um, and, and thinking about what are the lessons of this book for how we understand any controversial issue. So I, I am a, you know, I work in a day school, I'm a day school leader. Um, and I have parents, you know, many parents call me about our social studies curriculum, you know, and, and I think the debate about, you know, critical race theory or, or how we should tell the story of American history plays out in day schools, just as it is playing out in schools across, you know, the United States. And I find that the terms of the debate are just almost exactly the same. And seeing how, you know, the students that I work with who are really the age of the students in your study, um, they're doing exactly the same things, I think, with American history now as the students in your study are doing with the history of Israel. Um, and this book has led me to ask them questions. You know, I teach a current events class, so it's not, you know, it's not a rigorous study, but asking them like, oh, you know, tell me the story of America. Like, like what are the things that stand out to you in that story? And they just do exactly the same things in my experience, you know, and, and um, there are kindergartners, you know, who will talk about slavery, you know, and, and they won't necessarily um, ascribe it the significance that it has in the full social discourse, but they know that American history is contested. And so I found, I just found like, it just an enormously um, fruitful direction to go in for us to think about the relationship between um, the contemporary moment in American politics and Israeli politics and kind of what the book has to say to all of those things. Yeah, and, and Jonah particularly, and, and Sivan actually writes about this, about uh, the ways that educators are in a really tough spot, right? That in some ways, the rational thing for educators to do is to retreat, to say, no, we're, we're not gonna talk about controversial things. Like, I'm not gonna get myself in hot water by talking about controversial things. I'm going to stick to the kind of the safe territory, uh, the consensus, the places where, I, where and, and Sivan's point, book documents that the research documents that, no, no, the kids are desperate to have, to, to, for some frameworks, not, not to be told what to think, but, but to, for, the, for the places, for the, for the settings to be constructed to help, you know, to give them the opportunities to work through uh, these ideas. And, 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 uh, and I think you're exactly right that it, it is as relevant for American politics as it is, um, as it is for Israel. Robbie, turning over to you, tell us about uh, some of the things that stood out to you. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And uh... I've loved the book. I've loved following uh, Sivan's work from the moment she started talking about it, and it's been great to to read it all together and to see where where the thinking has has led her. Um, uh, I just wanted to follow follow on, I, I guess, from something that John and Jonah and, and Karen you've been talking about. That the the other piece is that is the subject matter itself is not a consensus. So there's very little room for the educator to authentically avoid or only deal with issues of consensus when they're talking about Israel, because Israel itself is not in consensus with itself uh, and is constantly changing in the way in which we're talking about it. And so to, to find that, um, uh, that broader perspective on how do we address things which are not in consensus. Um, so that was the, like Karen and, and like Jonah, one of the things that really excited me was, was the final chapter, which was, which to my mind, seemed to be talking about how I think the line is that they were not angry at Israel at all. They were angry with their teachers. Um, and there's a, there's a lesson for us to be taking broader than Israel education, broader than Jewish education, um, and that kids need practice to gain the resilience of living with a disagreement. Uh, and then it takes time and years in order to get better at it. 
it was a real was a point really well taken but quite often i think a lot of at least in the world that i'm working in a lot of the um uh, energy and resources are, are invested in israel education for teens before they get to campus or israel education for young adults uh, and this was a, effectively saying that that they're at a significant disadvantage if by that point they haven't come into contact with uh, uh, adult and teacher moderated tools for dealing with this, these kind of disagreements. But there are the two, I had two other sort of questions for, for, for Sivan. Um, one was that uh, in the opening chapter, or I think it was the second chapter, it talks about the four different uh, uh, kind of narratives that the kids were telling about Israel, be it a theological narrative or a biblical one or a or two other ones. Um, and uh, what it left me wondering was, this was a fascinating picture of, ha of, of that combination of what's caught and what's taught. And, and if anything, what I was picking up from your book was how much broader the range of information is caught than, we'd, than I'd originally assumed, right? That the, the taught bit is almost a minority in the amount of information which is caught from all sorts of different areas. And so one of the things that it's left me thinking of, so then what is the role of the teacher? And how significant might be the role of the teacher? If the teacher were to be in, intentional about teaching A, B, and C, to what extent are they actually gonna affect everything else that's caught? Or, or to what extent does the teacher need to alter his or her direction in order to address what's caught? That was question one, question one. And question two, um, uh, as you know, we've had this conversation ongoing when I work with, uh, with teachers working with younger kids. And for several years, I've been saying, yes, but Sivan Zakai, yes, but Sivan Zakai. <laughs> uh, and they've all been saying, uh, but because their main desire is not that we must avoid talking about controversial subjects, it's just they're too young. Um, we need to wait. And it is a little bit like that conversation of when should we tell the kids we got divorced, you know? You know, when she's three, she'll understand it. It will ruin the bat mitzvah. Maybe when she gets married, we'll let them know. Uh, and so it's always pushed down the line. And where Sivan's book is coming is saying, nah, it's, it's, it's actually not even now. It was 10 years ago. Um, and the pushback from the educators tends to be, yeah, but what does she know? She's only talked to 30 kids. They're not representative. They're from L.A. anyway. Um, it, it's a little bit like when John Cleese, uh, when Monty Python did a sketch about chartered accountants, and then he went to a, no, he went to a sketch about accountants, and he went to a party full of accountants, and he wanted to apologize, and they all said, no, 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 that's all right. I'm a surveyed accountant, they're chartered as accountant, that's something different. But what, what they were effectively saying is, this is not representative, this is nothing like my kids. And 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 your, your answer to me, uh, uh, Sivan, was great, which was, um, well, let them ask their kids and see what answers they get. And so my second answer is, it feels like there's a pedagogy hidden in your research methodology. Um, that it seems that there's something, you see, because I wouldn't trust some of these teachers to ask those questions because they would ask leading questions of their children. And the methodology that you're developing, that you've been using in order to listen very carefully a strikes me as very important for the educator to have, and also it strikes me as a, a fascinating uh, um, processing or a fascinating processing for the kids in order to, for them to do their own learning about what they've been taught and caught. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, great. Turning over to you, Sivan. Great. Tell, tell us how, you, how you're thinking about some of these, these uh, reactions. So I'll start with um, Robbie's last question about whether there's a pedagogy here. Um, I think there might be, and that was not my intention. My intention was to be the learner here and to have the kids be the teacher. But I think there was something more radical than I realized in doing that work, which is by making the children into the role of the teacher, right? I've asked them, many, many times, right? I'm, I'm going to be writing a book about how children think about Israel. What do you think that the adults should know? Um, and in doing that, I think, right, this is also how research changes people. So there's never a pure research, right? There's no like pristine 
environment, at, at least not in educational research where you can have the control group and the, you know, it, it doesn't work like that because in the very act of asking children to be the experts, they took that role very seriously, <laughs> right? And, um, and that part, I think there is certainly a pedagogical um, lesson to be learned. And in many ways that alters the, the, that is my answer to your first question, which is what is the role of the teacher? If the child becomes more important in finding information and processing that information, and it's not just about what we as adults know and can convey to children, but actually about how children themselves construct the world, that radically shifts the role of the educator. Um, because, and we have known this for a long time, and there are people who are scholars entirely of this idea, right? Everything you need to know that's factual is already in the palm of your hand from a very young age, right? Kids have access to digital information. What they don't have access to just by looking at a screen, which is why the teacher can never be phased out in a digital world is sense-making. How am I gonna think about this? How am I gonna understand what information is worthwhile? What information is credible? And what information matters to my ways of framing the world? And in that role, the teacher has to function as a facilitator and as a guide, not as the answer, right? If you think about a common thing that happens in Jewish educational settings and ask the rabbi where the kids gather around and they look at the rabbi and they ask questions and then the rabbi provides answers, right? I'm proposing an exact opposite of that where we, the adults ask questions of kids and then help them make sense of the things that they want to make sense of. And the really, really promising thing there is that they'll do it because they care, right? Part of the message of this book is certainly about things that children get angry about when we adults don't talk to them about it. But part of it is actually really, really hopeful because um, they're invested, right? They wanna know, they want to be responsible citizens. They want to be members of the Jewish community. This is not a story about young people's apathy or um, tuning out or not caring, right? Kids who are brought up in Jewish communities care about being parts of Jewish communities, but they also wanna shape what that means. And they can only do that when they have help thinking through things. And that means that we actually don't need the answers. This is the other nice thing that we can tell teachers who, who right? You actually don't need to have every answer. What is the fight? What should be the final status of Jerusalem? What is going to solve the Israeli Palestinian conflict? You don't need the answers to those questions in order to help children think through what does the world look like? What might it look like? And how are we part of that? That's what kids are saying they want to know. So let, let me push on that. And actually, I'll, I'll open this up for, for everybody. Um, you know, Sivan, one of the there's one moment in the book um, where, uh, where children are, are looking at a picture of an Israeli soldier and they identify the Israeli soldier as a Maccabee, right? The, that's a picture of a Maccabee, which I, I love that because it demonstrates um, on the one hand, a kind of knowledge, right? Like an identification of like this person to whom I as an American Jew are somehow connected it demonstrates some knowledge of like a military context and it gets it completely wrong, right? And you, you're very careful to also pay attention to the things that kids get wrong and when they get them wrong and how that process developed. So the, the cynic or the critic might say, um, there's all the stuff that kids don't know. Like, what does it actually, what do you mean make sense of the Palestinian conflict when they don't know and you've documented this. They they can't name the Palestinians. They can't name. They can't use the word until a certain point when they start to. But don't we have to teach them? Don't we have to teach them about different kinds of Jews in the world, different ethnic groups within within the Jewish community, so that then they can make sense of. They can start to do the work of making sense of internal Jewish conflict. Don't we have to teach them about 
I don't know, there's a, a you know, really powerful anecdote about the encounter, you know, one, one uh, girl's encounter at the Kotel um, when she finally discovers that the Kotel is not the Disneyland that she had been led to believe, but in fact, you know, she has to be separated from her two dads and her brother in her, in her experience with the Kotel. Well, don't we have to teach them stuff about Jewish religious practice so that she can even start to make sense of it? So there's a, there's a kind of, um, there's a stance uh, maybe it's an ideological stance that says, no, no, first we got to teach them some stuff before we can do this much more complicated work. Um, and I'm curious, Yvonne, how, I know you've thought about this a lot. I'm curious how you, how you will respond and, and also, uh, and also others. Yeah. So my first pushback against that framing, John, is your language start to, don't we have to teach them this so that they can start to understand? And I would say like, we've, we're not the ones starting, right? They, Children, this is, a, this is a larger statement about children's ways of thinking in the world. Children have agency over their lives with limits. Children have the ability to construct information in their own heads. They are doing this work constantly and they are doing it from a very young age. This book focuses on kids from the age of five through the end of elementary school. But um, with my colleagues, Anna Hartman and Lauren Applebaum, we've also done a study of even younger children three and four year old Jewish children. And this idea that the stories of the Jewish calendar are located in Israel is an idea that Jewish three and four year olds are already thinking about. So the, um, the first adjustment that people need to make in their heads is that we are somehow the, the sole or the primary catalysts, right? Actually, the children are thinking and they're asking and they're wondering and they're piecing together all sorts of information. I'm certainly not advocating for substantive, substanceless education, right? Of course, people need to learn history. The question that one of the questions I was asking in this book is at what age can they understand what concepts? Of course, they need to learn geography and shifting borders and how borders are themselves political, not just geographic. But at what age do they understand these things? Um, I myself was surprised, and I, I know some other people on this panel were surprised, um, to hear that some of the things that we assume are the easy things are actually the hard things for kids, and vice versa. So this question of chronology, right, how much time between the Maccabees and the IDF, that is absolutely conceptually out of reach for many young children. Um, question about, like, how is the culture of Tel Aviv different from the culture of Jerusalem? Well, that is in every Jewish textbook and every Jewish like children's board book rests on this idea that we're gonna go from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem to Haifa. But kids do not understand that kind of, like the nested nature of geography where there's a, a site which is in a city, which is in a country, which is in a geographic region. Kids don't get that from a young age. Um, but on the other hand, there's some things that they do get. So um, we have some really promising um, options for Hebrew language education because we know, and the book doesn't focus on this in particular, but um, from a larger body of research, we know that children actually learn language better when they're immersed in it from a young age. Three to five is the magic window in children's brain for language acquisition. And yet we're spending all this time with young kids talking about Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, right? So we have some mismatches between the kinds of things that kids do think about, but they want to think about big questions. And my, my other response to that, um, that framing, and I know John, you were giving voice to a common challenge from educators um, is again, why are we learning all of this? And who gets to decide? And I think that um, kids get to decide some of what they learn about and what they care about, and that we should be figuring out what parts of the information, right? Over time, they will construct a big picture, but what gets constructed at any moment, part of that gets to come from what children are ready to hear about and what they want to learn about. Great, thank you. Others, uh, anybody wanna build on that? I would love to just add add one thing. I mean, I think um, I, I often find that there are a lot of assumptions 
that, that are also built into the perspective you articulated that are different than the ones Sivan identified about kind of what actually works in terms of teaching kids stuff. And I, I think it's a conversation I have in the school where I work of, of people saying, well, well, like they have to know all these things. And so I have to tell them all of these things. And then that ends up leading to lessons where people are like, well, they need all of this background information and the way that I'll get it to them is by saying it to them. And then I, I often ask a question. So like, how did that go? Like, do they all know those things? And usually like when we look at student work and assessments, it turns out like that actually just doesn't work that well. Like I believe that you could get up and you could say, you know, actually like the Hasmonean revolt was in 167 BCE and the IDF is, you know, today in the 20th century and most first graders are gonna struggle even if you tell them that, right? And they'll still think that the IDF are, are the Maccabees. And I, and I do think that like, um, it was interesting when, you know, in Robbie in your comments, um, you, you know, you were asking, is there a pedagogical agenda? And Zivan, you denied a pedagogical agenda. I actually think there, there is a pedagogical agenda that a way of teaching kids is to care about what they think about things. You know, I, I think actually that's one of the lessons of, of the book that, that if we want kids to know who the Hasmoneans are and who the IDF is, if we want them to have all that information, all those facts, the way to actually accomplish that is, is through this kind of constructivist um, process of trying to tell a story and then reading something and then going back and revising it. And, and it's a messier process and it, it's sort of building the airplane in flight. But I, but I do think that we know that that actually works better than, um, than trying to start with information and then only later get to meaning making. I, I think we know that that isn't how humans learn. Karen, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I was going to jump in on, you know, perhaps building on Jonah, but also highlighting a, a different tension, which I think emerges later in the book between this idea that sometimes has guided Israel education around the connection of the learner to Israel and perhaps more the cognitive or inquiry based or, um, you know, so it's not exactly affective versus cognitive, because I think Sivan's book highlights that in, in this inquiry, you have both affect and, and cognition. And so they are sort of intermixed. But sometimes there's also that sequencing, like first they should love Israel and then we can do these other things. And I think one of the, the, the key learnings of the book is around this notion that we don't actually determine the, the ways in which they're gonna go through this process. And I think to, you know, how do we guide or contextualize what it is that they are engaged in or curious about or thinking about. But I do wonder as we think more broadly about this question of like, where where how do we manage this tension or what is, are there certain, if not um, things they need to know, but what then become the goals? Is it fully driven just by the things that they they uh, come into? And in the case of the kids that you were learning, at least as their starting point, there were a group of kids who were gonna be highly exposed to many of the things that we traditionally think they ought to know about. And that may not be for, you know, representative of the broader Jewish educational experience that many young Jews have and for whom there is a greater concern around that first connection before other things. And so I'm curious about that tension and um, you know, what we've learned from, from the kids that, that, you, that you studied. Yeah, so, so what would it look like you know, to, to redo this study or something similar with, with other populations with, right, and to, to pay attention? Robbie, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I wanna kind of slightly play devil's avocado here because um, as, in terms of information, I'm interested by that because um, I was struck by this in reading in the in, in the book and the particular uh, example of the kid mixing up Maccabees and and uh, an Israeli soldier, because um, the discourse in Israel over the last ten years makes exactly the same smudging, deliberately and consciously and theologically. Um, and there have been many examples of, of both uh, of, of rabbis within the army and the discourse in Israel, especially in religious Israel, does very much make that connection and to an extent ignores chronology because uh, religious concepts of, of history seem to be that they, they'll, they'll cycle in different ways. And that's what leads me to a, a question about this, what knowledge they should have or should be taught or whatever. Um, my concern would be, and I have very little concerns about your work, as you know, but my concern would be that 
um, what they're ending up on doing, these kids, and, and w working from what they know and what they're interested in, is they're going to end up, my concern would be that they end up learning about what Americans think about Israel, as opposed to learning about Israel. Um, and now a lot of teachers don't necessarily fix that either, but but there's there's something there that 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 my, my concern is that it ends up being somewhat circular, um, and and very much, uh, however much we're want, we're starting with asking questions, it emerges from our own ideology as American educators as to how the world should be and how we see the world. When in Israel, more and more people, it's not yet a majority, but it's coming, are going to be are seeing the world in very very different directions and sites and yeah that yeah and if and I'm, i want to build on that robbie um by adding in one of the questions from the audience um Robbie, if i understand you correctly that there the the virtue of sivan's book and and the approach of really paying really really close attention to where these kids what these kids are thinking uh, when they, as it were, when they come to us, wherever the us is, um, is that we are in effect uh, seeding the agenda to whatever that uh, that environment is. And there's a question there about uh, about anti-Israel contexts, um, and I wonder there too um, to what extent the work of Israel education gets sort of hijacked by an agenda if if kids, and I don't know whether it's, it's true, Steve, I don't remember whether you found this at all, um, if they are operating in environments that where they hear certain anti-Israel messages, then, then that somehow becomes the agenda of Israel education to process, to think through, and is that what we want? Do we want to be so, I mean, to put it really negatively, reactive to somebody else's agenda? Sarah, have you ever thought about that? Yeah, I have lots of thoughts about that. I will try and keep them brief. Um, so first of all, the empirical question is an easy question. Did kids hear anti-Israel sentiment? Of course. There's a kid in the study who told me in fourth grade a pretty heartbreaking story about how she's decided to take off her Magen David when she goes to her public school because she does not want to engage her teachers in conversations that she knows will be all about why Israel is a bad thing. That was her, her language. Um, so for sure, kids are, are dealing with that. Not all kids, um, but there were certainly kids in the study who, who talked about that phenomenon. Um, and all of this conversation raise, raises a larger question about, wait, why should Jews, young Jews, Jewish children in the United States even learn about Israel? And there are all sorts of competing schools of thought um, both in the, um, the academic discourse on Israel education and in the world of practice about, about why that should be. And I totally understand Robbie's concern about um, Israel education being used for purposes that have nothing to do with Israel. Um, and half of me shares that concern. And the other half of me thinks that's, that's fine, that does not bother me. Um, the part of me that shares Robbie's concern um, really believes that you can't understand Israel in any serious way without understanding um, the, the communities that, Ob that Robbie is talking about, right? What does it look like to be a religious Zionist and how is that distinct from the kinds of Zionism that exist in the United States, for example? But the other half of me, and I think this part is louder in my head after listening to all of the children, is the, um, the powers and the limits of Israel education as a way of doing a broader sense of civic education. I did not just hear from these kids that they want to understand about Israel and more things about Israel. I heard from these children they want to make sense of what it means to be a human being on planet Earth in a really tough time, by the way, to be a human being on planet Earth. And the particular places in which they are situated matter, right? They're not in Israel, and that also matters. And they want to understand what does it mean to be an American citizen 
and what does it mean to be a Jew? And Israel certainly is part of that larger picture without a doubt, but it is only a part of that larger picture. And to me, that larger context matters because it's actually what matters in education writ large, right? Education is, a, is an enterprise. It's a project of helping people become the people that they are. And Israel is part of that. And it's an important part of that for these children, but it's only a part of that. Thanks. Um, any any um, thoughts or reactions to, to that argument? This is, by the way, I, I take, I, I mentioned at the outset, the sort of broader argument for the book. And I think that was, uh, Sivan, you just offered a, a, an, um, a version of that, that, that what Israel education is about is not facts about Israel, or should be about rather, is not facts about Israel and not feelings about Israel, but rather um, a kind of civic education. Um, you say that I'm, I'm now reading on page 192, uh, Israel education is an important component of Jewish education because it offers a particularly rich case for exploring civic and political aspects of Judaism and Jewish life. That's um, one way of kind of reframing that that broader uh, argument, and and it the argument emerges from your um, from your attention to this frustration that they express, even from fairly early on, about um, ways that they're not, they don't have opportunities to talk about these important issues, um, especially uh, uh, around Israel, but not only about Israel. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how that broader argument sounds to, um, to the rest of you. I was going to jump in, if that's okay. Um, you know, what's really interesting to me is that in the interviews that I conducted with educators, um, on the other side of this, who, you know, the question around like, what are their barriers? Many of the educators uh, were able to articulate why it was important to engage with conflict at later ages in life. And they actually use the argument around, well, this is really good practice for civic education and for critical thinking and for a lot of the broader educational goals. And so it's interesting to think about what happens when you rewind the clock a little and realize that like, there's an opportunity that doesn't just emerge later, but also in terms of these, this broader educational agenda. Um, for me, the other piece is around what does it mean to engage with Israel and broadening the tent of what that engagement can possibly look like. And I think when the, the lens of engagement is through um, actually um, creating the space for them to engage civically with Israel and to care really deeply enough to advocate for political or you know, civically engaged positions around issues that are really tough, um, really tough within America and really tough within Israel, and that they can make these connections and understand that there are real issues that are hard and at stake and that that speak to the questions of what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be a democracy and what it means to be a human or a Jew or what are, are you know, what are the morals that guide our behaviors in different contexts. Um, it may be a little bit uncomfortable, right? Um, because it may not always be rosy or it may not always be um, flowery but it's real, right? And I think that that realness really stands out in, in many of the comments that um, either for the things they were curious about or the things they already felt that like they knew there was something there even if they couldn't put all the details in, but they knew this was a real issue. And I think for example, the Kotel story really highlighted that. Like she understood in that moment that gosh, there's a question of women's rights that is happening before her or what it why you know why are spaces segregated in different kinds of ways that she's uncomfortable with and what does that mean personally but also what does that mean at a national level at this place that's supposed to be so important and mythical and feels maybe not the place I connect to or that I'm struggling boy those are like the heart of so many key issues that are being discussed in the Knesset or that are being discussed in Israeli society and they're not on the side they're the center and they're curious and that's like when you get and this is I think I've learned a lot from about this from Robbie but when you get to that point where you're like heated and leaning in like that's actually real great Israel education and that's real connection and when you're sort of like yeah I can you know fill in a map and maybe I'm not sure that's the that's not the part that sticks and it certainly like the book really highlights that like that's they weren't so excited about flags they were much more excited especially as they got older about other stickier things. And Karen, as I'm thinking, I mean, especially because you started with, by by referring to your work with teachers, your your uh, your interviewing of teachers, um, 
it's hard if i'm a if i'm a teacher it's hard to take a step into that space it's hard to take the step from saying to myself look my job is to learn as much about israel as i can and to help my students understand as many facts as i can or or context or whatever to saying like my job is to hold this very uncertain conversation i actually don't know where it's going to go because that's the whole point of the conversation is it's unpredictable and as Sivan calls it a prism question right because it opens up so many important differently colored possibilities um uh that's that's really hard and it means a very different kind of of teacher preparation it's one of the questions that was asked in in the um in the chat um, a very different kind of teacher preparation uh than simply learning a lot about israel other thoughts i'd like to jump in and share Please. um a story that is not in the book because it was told to me not by one of the children in the study but i, I had a whole group of shadow children whose parents and they themselves agreed to let me test questions on them so they're not part of the research, but I've also followed these kids for a bunch of years. And um, I really wanna pick up on, on that question or that word that John just used about uncertainty. And like, we don't know where this is gonna lead because to me, that is one of the most important things that I hear kids asking for. After the tree of life shooting in Pittsburgh, when the kids, I believe they were in fifth or sixth grade at the time. I asked a kid who, again, not formally part of the study, but a kid on whom I often tried out questions before I used them on the kids in the study. And I said, I had two questions. Is it safe to live in Israel? And the kid said, well, I mean, I mean, I know there's war and conflict, but I think it's a pretty safe place, especially for Jews. And, and then I said, and is it safe to live in the United States? And he looked at me in the eye and said, well, when you put it that way, if you really want me to talk about that, it's not safe to live anywhere. The planet is warming, there's gun violence, I see nothing but like, you want to talk to me about an uncertain future? Like that we can talk about. And I thought, how wise from this sixth grader, because part of what he was saying, and he, he literally said, you're asking me the wrong question. Um, because I think the question you should be asking me is not, is it safe, but how, do we learn to live knowing that it's not always safe? And the, this obviously transcends the, the particular moment in which this child was saying it. And in light of recent events, it is like um, renewed heartbreak when I think about this child's answer to my question and his pushback against me. And to me, that is the enterprise, right? How do we support children to live in the world? And the world is an uncertain place and it is a beautiful place and it is a messy place and it is a glorious place and it is all of that. And helping children live through that, navigate that and figure out who they are in that and who they want to be in that, that is the purpose. And so in that regard, it is about Israel education, but it is also beyond Israel education. Thank you. Thank you, Sivan. We only have a few minutes left i want to um i want to ask each of our panelists before i i give sivan the final final word i want to ask each of our panelists um briefly um when you think about who should read this book and, and what they should take away um i'm curious uh how you would respond to that um see robbie can i call on you to go first Sorry, it was difficult to mute. Um, the entire world should read <laughs> this. Um, but seriously, um, if they're up for it, any parent, um, and if they're able to put the Jew Israel thing aside, any educator. And if we're focusing in, then certainly educators of younger kids. But, um, but it, it's. I think it's precisely where, where, where Sivan was taking things at things at the end is that this is 
there's something much deeper and broader about this research that goes beyond the Jews, beyond kindergarten teaching and beyond Israel. Okay, thank you. Jonah, over to you. Um, I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question that um, I, I think actually in the in the chat, um, Elliot asked a couple of questions about about day schools and and educators. And I think for me, those are the people that I think about um, the most. You know, and I and I think this actually just sort of picks up some of the themes, John, that you and Sivan were were just sort of talking about. I mean, I think yes, it is really really hard to be a teacher. Like like I think like if it were easy then the world would be really different, you know? And I, and I think that um, the question of how teachers need to be trained, you know, I, I, I think for me, it, it actually, there is real practice that can happen in pre-service training. And there's also in-service training that is focused on this question of, uh, you know, exploiting teachable moments, right? Listening to the people you have in the room. That doesn't mean that they're in the driver's seat. That doesn't mean that we're not trying to teach them things. But what it means is that the student, their learning is at the center of what we do and their well-being is what's the most important thing. And so I think that, you know, the kind of training that you need is, is a kind of, almost kind of a humility, you know, that, that you don't know the answer, that you're listening to the people in the room, that you're trying to create a journey for them. And it is true, you do not know where it will end. And, and even schools that have very, very specific kinds of outcomes in their missions, they also are not universally successful, right, in, in achieving those outcomes. So I think that should just give us all pause. It's not a choice between, well, do we emphasize process or outcome? I, I think that, you know, the process processes everything. Um, you know, I was in a phonics lesson yesterday in first grade where I think the word victim, because it's a phonetic word, came up and the teacher went, victim, victim. And a kid said, oh, like the kids in Texas. And it was like this heart-wrenching moment. Um, and the teacher, you know, you know, and, and the teacher in that moment, she she went like this. She looked at the kid in the eye and she said, yes, like the kids in Texas, and then went on with the lesson. And I just felt like what a beautiful moment that she just saw what the kid was thinking about. And, you know, there's no preparation for that, but but also there is. So I, I think that's sort of my lesson to, like like that I take from the book of like, really, you got to listen and, and really be in the journey, you know, with with your students. Thanks. Ken, over to you. Um, so I'm going to start where Robbie started, which is everyone. But I guess I'll start that I think I do think that for parents, it's an important lesson about Israel, and but it's also and just an important lesson about children and where they're at. And um, I think I've shared with the panels here that like you know my eldest child really ch changed the the course of my career in many ways through the questions that he asked. Um, and but I know that that's true for for the rest of them. And I think sometimes it's a healthy reminder of like how do we listen better and how do we know where they are? And I know that's sort of the, often the language that we speak about, but I think Sivan really demonstrates a method and a pedagogy for asking the kinds of questions that allow us to really listen differently and to be open to possibilities that we can't even exactly imagine, uh, whether that's about Texas or any other thing that they've um, come across one way or another. Um, I think the, the educational lessons here, I think, are, are really important for educators that are in this space, but I'd say I want to push it up, which is to say even those that teach college and high school kids should read this because at least they know who they're getting when they show up, right? Because um, I think it, it would be obvious for kindergarten through sixth grade teachers to learn what uh, the kids are saying, but it's also important for those who are getting them in high school and who might have questions about where, where their starting point might already be, or it's actually a continuation point. And I guess the the final, um, I think that I think this is also a book that um, can help reframe the broader Israel educational agenda. And here I'm thinking about educational leaders like Jonah and others in the space who get to decide and think about what Israel education ought to look like in their schools or in their institutions or in their summer camps. Um, because for me, I think what I've heard often is that educators who see this, who hear this, who actually know this, not the ones Robbie said originally were denying it, but those that see it are still frightened, are still worried, and don't always feel that they have the support of their administration and their lay leaders in having these kinds of conversations. And so they they do pull back or they do they are reticent. And so actually administrators and lay leaders ought to know that these are the conversations that kids are thirsty for. And then maybe they can help support the educators 
because that barrier is the hardest one to overcome. It's the who's got my back and what will happen when I get that phone call from the parent who maybe didn't want to have that conversation. And so for me, that's a, a systemic change that can happen from those that can read the book and see, gosh, these kids, we're, we're doing them a disservice by not giving them the space to contextualize, to think through, to make meaning from the things that they're learning out in the world. And if they give that permission to their educators, what boy, I can't, I can only imagine the impact that this book will have. Nicely said. Thank you, Karen. Sivan, last word over to you. Anything Thank you, you still all. try to figure out? <laughs> thank you all for um, for coming and for joining this conversation today, and especially thank you to the panelists. Um, picking up on a, a, a thread that both Jonah and Karen have just talked about, I want everyone who's here today to know that there are lots of people, including everyone who's on this panel today, who to do serious work to support teachers in their ongoing journey, because of course this is hard work, and that is part of what makes it meaningful um, and uplifting, and um, like the best job in the world, being a teacher, and also the hardest, and sometimes the worst. And so there's certainly, we, we have a, um, there are lots of avenues for professional support and professional development, and we all do that work. Um, and then I would just say as a kind of a parting word to any skeptics who are still listening and don't want to have these conversations with children, I would just say, um, you know, John mentioned that I made this analogy in the book, but I will end with this. Israel education is a lot like sex education. You don't have to talk about this with the children in your lives, but they're going to learn about it, whether you talk to them about it or not. And so assuming that the, we want kids to be supportive, to have trustworthy adults, assuming that we as adults want to be able to impact both the values and the understanding that children have, um, who better to have the conversation with than us, us the educators, us the parents, us the grandparents, us the adults who may not have all the answers, but are certainly willing to talk with children about the questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Sivan, um, not just for the book, um, but also for your leadership of this, uh, of this project um, for, for these many years. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all who have uh, come to join us. I want to remind everyone that the book is available for purchase at NYU Press. Um, there's the discount code again in the chat. Um, you should feel free to use that. Um, I also want to encourage people to keep an eye out for the June newsletter from the Mandel Center, which will include links to um, videos from uh, events we've had in the past year. Um, we are we do have two upcoming events I want to mention. There are about two other books that are forthcoming. Uh, one will be uh, an event for a edited volume from uh, Diane Tickton Schuster called Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning which is uh, coming out from a, a project by that name at the Mandel Center. We're excited about that. And, um, and the second forthcoming book is Joe Reamer's book called Making Shabbat, which is about Shabbat in American Jewish summer camps, uh, which is being published in the Mandel Brandeis series in Jewish education at Brandeis University Press. Please uh, keep an eye out for more information about those two events uh, in the coming weeks. Um, with that, thank you again, Sivan. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us. Um, take care. Be well.